There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the One Within All, back to another episode of Interverse. Excited, as always, to be delivering an excellent conversation. Today, we've got the return of Matt Presti. Matt is the president of the University of Science and Philosophy, which is also known as the Walter Russell Foundation. Uh, they have been collecting and keeping the works of the late genius Walter Russell, who was a master artist and is also an illuminated scientific innovator. And Matt's also been responsible for putting together an amazing Walter Russell Museum since the last time we spoke with him. He's also a musician. Matt is himself and all around awesome dude from my home state of Missouri as well. It's been too long since we spoke with him and I'm excited to get into it with him again. I want to lead us in with a quote that Matt has shared with me from Walter. It's a home study course and it really encapsulates the idea of creativity and genius in the dichotomy between the spiritual and physical planes. So I'm going to read this quote. Humans must think outwardly through the senses in order to live and function in a sense objective universe. But the genius who thinks inwardly towards the light of his self can vision or imagine that which spiritually exists and can then think outwardly through his senses and cause his mentally visional image to exist physically. That is what creation is and what the genius creator does. So that's a really useful way to start framing our conversation. We're going to be talking about the difference between the sense reality universe and the spiritual truth within ourselves, the still God point, if you will, within our deepest part of our mind <laughs> and also want to remind everyone that if they want to check out the university that matt is responsible for taking care of it's philosophy.org find that in the show notes and also you can see more of what matt does and his music and other things at mattpresti.com so without further delay let's get this started this conversation's been a long time overdue welcome back to the show matt thanks for being here uh, it's great to join you again chance Thanks for the invitation. Oh, yeah, it's my pleasure, dude. I'd love to uh, have you catch us up a little bit to what's been going on in your world since way back in, gosh, two years ago when we recorded the last podcast. It seems unreal that it's been that long. <laughs> yeah, it's been a minute. Um, well, part of my uh, rollout for uh, being president of the university, I should just say I, I have to disclaim now. Uh, but I don't speak on behalf of either fire department I volunteer for or necessarily the University of Science and Philosophy regarding my own personal opinions. But um, officially, um, I can say regarding the university, um, the plan that I had back in 2015 was always to get Walter Russell's artwork back out on display. I'm enjoying your cat, by the way. He's totally cool. <laughs> yeah, in the video, uh, my cat Gandalf is behind my head. You guys could see it if you're watching the video version. Yeah, Gandalf's a great cat. He's a helpful spirit for podcasting. Thanks for being here also, Gandalf. <laughs> Cheers to Gandalf. But yeah, back to the uh, story of the university. Um, I'd always planned to, to see Walter's artwork back out on display. And uh, between Walter and Leo, they had 64 tons, I approximated, of art, sculpture, personal effects. And we moved all that back in uh, 2018 in uh, September. And uh, it took seven people nine days, and it was approximately um, 11 semis worth of uh, material that we had to move. And I, having never moved sculpture before, that was sort of an interesting experience because, you know, you don't want to be the guy that breaks Walter's stuff. So fortunately, I had had uh, 15 years of audio technical work and unloaded semis and loaded semis for years. So I had that experience under my belt and forklift 
operation. And it seemed like everything in my life prepared me for that big move. And uh, anyways, we moved everything with zero breakage again in nine people. And uh, it was just the most massive thing I've ever done. And it took a full year to actually set it up and uh, get the building turned and ready for uh, the museum to, to, to be set up. Incredible displays. I'd say um, everything that used to be at Swananoa, people can go to philosophy.org and go to the museum and click on gallery and you'll see pictures of where the former headquarters of the university was at the Medici Palace built in 1912 called Swananoa Palace. And I'd say only 60% of Dr. Russell's artwork was actually on display because they just didn't have the room. So we were able to actually get about 98% <clears throat> of his art on display, which is just great because he, he has so much uh, from the scientific work to the sculpting, to the drawings, and then the uh, just incredible uh, paintings that adorn the halls of the university location, which is 518 West Main Street in downtown Waynesboro, Virginia. It's, it's quite a beautiful location. And I encourage anybody, if you're in Virginia, to make a stop there because it's definitely worth your time. And our uh, operations manager, Jim Porter, will give you a great tour. It's, it's really a wonderful thing to uh, experience uh, the work of a profound genius like Dr. Russell and his wife, Leo, I should say, as well. Yeah, absolutely. I got to see a virtual tour of the museum that you shared on the Unslaved podcast a while back. And that was inspiring in itself. And I wasn't even in the actual room with the stuff. Um, it's, it's amazing to see the real scope of human potential being expressed. Like I've heard people say Walter Russell is basically the reincarnated Leonardo da Vinci of our time. But I mean, in a sense, he surpasses Leonardo da Vinci because the tools that are available to him probably surpass Leonardo's and uh, it's just really remarkable. And I hope that people in Virginia do, or maybe even travel to Virginia just to see that. I know that if I'm ever anywhere within three hours or so of that place, I'm definitely going to make a stop. I do wish that it was in Missouri. You probably do too, but uh, I'm sure there's a good reason why it's all in Virginia. My question about the amount of work that you've collected there is, do you know what percentage of his overall works might be estimated to be collected there? Uh, there's probably a lot that's out in the world, right? Well, we've done some collecting. We've been able to obtain a few paintings. Some people buy paintings that are Russell paintings and then donate them to the museum, which is really great, too. We, we had about three or four paintings donated. Um, we've heard of estimates from, from different sources, but ultimately the the... the most agreed to number is that 2% of his work is actually in our museum and the other 98% is out in the world. So that, that includes different sculptures, different paintings, thousands and thousands of you know, drawings and paintings. Um, one of our historians, Arison Wonderly, is actually putting a book together on his early illustrations and she has several hundred illustrations that he did for like Collier's magazine um, and other magazine periodicals around the turn of the, the 20th century. He was prolific as, as a illustrator. He also illustrated for children's books and various authors uh, and others. So he, he was just all around prolific. And, and I'd say, you know, our, our most accurate estimate is that only 2% of the work that he actually did is on display at the museum. And and that was um, about 40 tons. <laughs> and that took you nine days to unload it out of 11 semis. I mean, good Lord. Yeah, I mean, we, we had a 24 foot, 26 foot box truck and we loaded it and we loaded uh, three or four personal vehicles as well. Uh, one had a trailer on it, a 15 foot trailer. So we, we actually just estimated that we had about 11 semis worth of, of stuff and you know, it was a monumental thing to do, but of all the things I've done in my life, that, that show that I set up was the biggest show I've ever, you know, put together. And it's an art show that's, you know, a permanent install, hopefully. And, uh, 
we can keep the thing open long enough with all the COVID nonsense going on, you know, we might actually, you know, get to the point where we could raise enough money for, you know, his work to be perpetually taken care of so that future posterity, you know, will always have the benefit of, you know, the artwork. And one thing I should say about Dr. Russell is he, you know, a lot of people put out spiritual messages, but he always asserted that the proof that his message worked over others was the massive amount of art that he was able to, you know, procure on by his own two hands. And that's sort of the demonstration that his spiritual message was one that has a practical backbone that can be looked at and observed by anybody who can who can just say to themselves, my God, how, how did you do all this? You know, and with only a fourth grade education at that, he was able to produce, you know, 40 tons of art and sculpture uh, with just a, you know, I think he went to the Massachusetts Normal Art School from 14 to 16 years old. But uh, more or less, he, he just stressed that the most important thing people, you know, could learn is their letters and their numbers. Beyond that, you don't really need schooling because, you know, the world is a school and to have a vocation, a love for something is what you should follow. And he said he was fortunate to be taken out of school at nine years old before it ruined him. So uh, interesting quote there. And a lot of geniuses share in that regard, I think. That's a good assessment. I mean, it's a whole conversation topic in and of itself to go back and examine how public schooling came about in the form that we have it now, the way that it was really designed and intended to create authority, obedient, non-creative people, uh, non-outside the box thinkers, really. So I wouldn't say that someone's doomed if they went to public school. I definitely went to public school and went through all that and even went to a, a university, if you will, a universe city. <laughs> the universe itself is the teacher, though. I think that's really uh, this is the university we're in it at all times. I think that's a really good point. And it definitely resonates with the background of this podcast to state that the the real proof in the pudding of Walter Russell's message is the amazing, amazing, prolific nature of his works. And it's not just tons and tons of, of junk or, you know, attempted artwork. It's like masterpiece artwork. I think that's something that people listening ought to take a moment to go look up some of Walter Russell's stuff. Not only were his paintings, you know, things like portraits or, or more classical styles of art, he actually used his artistic skills to explain the scientific ideas that he was coming at from uh, the intuitive understanding of the mechanics of the universe. He would put those into amazing visual art forms. Um, and sometimes they can be really helpful to understanding the ideas he's trying to express. And I think that's not really common with scientists these days that they're typically more oriented on the full left brain side of the spectrum, completely mechanistic and uh, looking at parts and not holes and not expressing creatively the ideas that they're trying to investigate. So uh, the, <laughs> the, the greatest way of describing it, I think it goes back to that quote at the beginning is that we have, I've heard you say this before we have so many thousand of, thoughts a day but how many of those thoughts actually get put into a body and given life the way that you know a micro um, in a microcosm of the way the creator of the universe did with the creation that we all inhabit yeah i mean what is it 60 to eighty thousand human thoughts a day and which one are you going to hold and actually birth you know we, we have the ability to birth our ideas and one of the great uh, takeaways for me from the, the Russell's home study course, which is basically a course on, on becoming a self-creator, a master creator. And um, they, they can't stress enough in that course that the greatest discovery a person can make in this lifetime, in this world, is the discovery of their self. And what is the self, really? And that's uh, something that science skips over. Unfortunately, it's always trying to uh, define everything with outside external parameters and, and weights and measures and uh, data, you know, data sets and things like that. 
And really, you know, that's why I, I really appreciate the work on over at Unslave because it's, you know, taking into account psychology and psychology is mind, the study of mind or soul. Psyche is soul in Greek. So, you know, you're actually with psychology, you're, you're, you're completing the spiritual quest, if you will. And I saw a recent post you had done, too, on uh, shadow. So maybe we could discuss that a little bit, too. But uh, interestingly enough, you know, the Russells were, were just very practical. And the ability to birth bodies by holding an idea in your mind long enough, you know, you don't let it go. Don't let it fleet. You know, hold it. Keep it there. Write it down if you must, especially in the mornings when you wake up. A lot of your dreams are full of ideas and things like that. So ultimately, anything you put your mind to, if you hold that thought and you begin to acquire the needed resources for building that thought into a body, then you behold that body will stand before you after a certain period of time. The big thing most people don't want to do is wait, <laughs> you know, and nothing good comes quick. So you got to you got to make it, you know, you got to have that. Um, that sense of patience that I think, you know, patience is the greatest virtue, they say. And why is that? Because, you know, in a culture where everybody wants everything right now, right now, right now, fast food, you, you don't want to wait 30 minutes for somebody to cook. You know, that's why, you know, we're, we're seeing the obesity rates. We're seeing so many things that go along with the lifestyle that's quick and fast and furious. And the detrimental side of that is damage to the physical body. And then also you have, uh, you know, damage to the mind and damage to the spirit. So ultimately, there's that three sided, the triangle of life, it's been called um, spiritual, mental and physical. And if they're all in balance, you're going to have a well balanced self in an individual. But ultimately, um, knowing the process of creation uh, is easier when those things are balanced as well. And so a good amount of psychology, psychological work. Uh, helps, you know, to re-engineer the self into a usable um, parameter that, that can, you know, do the kind of work that patience requires, set long-term goals, and be inspired to follow through to the very end, whatever it is. And like I said, when I started in 2015 at the university, I had no idea how I was going to find a museum, number one, where the money would come from. Um, but everything just began to line up as I worked toward it and it started to unfold. And in my own visionary experience uh, in 2015, around my birthday, uh, the still small voice revealed to me that in three and a half years, we would have a physical location. And exactly nearly to the day, um, we had found a place where we you know, moved all the artwork to and were able to acquire it. So, you know, listen to the still small voice, follow through and... Uh, you know, you have to birth your ideas. You can't rely on other people to do it. And the minute you start to work toward it, one of my favorite things that Russell said is the universe is, is the most perfect mirror. The, the light, the light of the creator is, is a perfect mirror and it will reflect perfectly your desirings, your imaginings and your, your, Im your images that you hold in your mind. So as you work to unfold whatever it is that is your goal or desire, the universe will work with you and every step you take toward that unfoldment, the universe will take a step toward unfolding it with you. And that's the beautiful thing about working knowingly with the creator, which is again, everything the Russell's taught the creator is you to the degree that you're aware of it. And so it's a very uh, personal yet impersonal journey at the same time. Yeah, dude, you just took it right to kind of, the place I wanted to move next, which was the deep, deep question of what is the self? And you, you nailed it when you said the creator is you. And it's something I like to mention. I like to say that to people. I like the maxim all is self, but I have kind of pulled back on saying it far and wide because I think that if a person hasn't got the foundational inner understanding that we're not talking about the little s self being what is the all we're not talking about the all is your egoic self by no means your individual will or desires are not necessarily reflective of what your higher self is or the true total self and 
I think that the best way to get the universe to work with you, apart from aligning your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions, is to put those into alignment with the overall will of creation, which is love, which is the recognition and nurturing of the infinite possibilities that are Spur, uh, you know, birth out of source, out of the infinite. So, uh, yeah, l- let's talk a little bit about the nature of the self. If you have any insight to share with us on that subject, because it's never, never a bad thing to ponder or remind oneself about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, the self really to to go a little bit more on the point of the ego, you know. The ego, I, I like to assign um, words to, you know, letters. Ego to me is externally generated outlook. It's your your external view of the world, how you relate to other people, how you think they see you, and what you think the reflection of yourself actually is. So, a lot of people don't know about the ego, which is the inward thinking direction which is what every great artist has, what every great creator, uh, poet, genius has. They, they are able to go within to think inwardly toward the soul and listen with their inner ears and see with their inner eyes. Um, that's using your imagination, your eye, magi, nation lens, if you will. Um, becoming the magi is, is developing a relationship with the inner world. The inner world is really everything. And, uh, pretty much all our sciences, uh, all our uh, vocations in, in university is teaching you to affect the external world by being an, an externalist. And I call it materialistic externalism because truly it is one of the, the most profound illnesses that uh, is taught in this world, you know, to, to settle and change the world by burning things down. It's, it's never worked. It never will work because it's not just Western civilization, but it's, it's people's own, they're very living, they're very houses, you know, and we're seeing that play out because of the discontent in people. And the reason people are discontent, number one, they're taught to hate. They learn to hate by people that teach them to hate. And it's unfortunate because that's not a university education. It's a political agenda with an ideology that is hell bent on destroying what they should be teaching, which is critical thought, imagination, the use and proper use of your imagination. And like Buckminster Fuller said, building a new system to replace the old one. You know, that's that's the way we need to, you know, move civilization ahead. And so. Uh, a lot of the psychological work that, that one has to do is understanding how the media and how the current, uh, what, what, what would I even call them, the current uh, professors in many universities are teaching this model of hate to understand why this is happening, why it's, uh, it's being allowed, why it's backed by so many corporations, again, number one. We're moving full steam ahead into a corptocracy. And I like to uh, think when the Russells had said, you know, corporations are the actual model that can unify the human race in a brotherhood and sisterhood because they're worldwide. They have all the potential to hire different people under one banner of of a corporation. This is back in the early 50s when they, they talked about corporations being a possible vehicle to achieve you know, a more peaceful and, and more better world. And unfortunately, we look around now and the corporations are basically playing politics. And it's terrible. I mean, it's terrible to, you know, create further division in people. And I like to say, if it divides people, what good is it? So you look at things like the NASCAR hoax, you look at things like, you know, the the BLM movement that is, again, a political uh, divisive, <laughs> divisively political agenda with a Marxist, you know, front. And it's unfortunate because, you know, the opportunities that were available to humans when genuine tragedies occur to unify the human race are squandered because of petty divisive stances that are taken by not only corporations, which again, 
could have the power to unify man if they were used correctly, as opposed to being divisive weapons. So in, in, in the search for the self, you have to go through all these different things and look at all the different um, psychological aspects that media uses, that corporations use, that movements use. And, you know, you can't be too absorbed in it because you lose yourself. And that's the, the biggest commodity, the greatest commodity and the most priceless possession one could have in this world today is their self, the control of their own self, their own thoughts, original, authentic, true thoughts that come from within, not being told how to think from without. And, uh, you know, that's that's a lifelong practice and it takes a great amount of effort, but it can be done. Um, the shadow, not just the physical body is the shadow, but also the mind is a shadow. There's shadows in the mind that if you don't uh, weed, weed out these shadows and, and iron them out and integrate them into your being, you know, psychological traumas, for instance, that happen to a child when they're little, which all of us have experienced in some form or another, can be integrated to complete, you know, a whole person. The journey of life basically is making yourself whole. You know, this is a very long process, but the more whole you become, the more genius you become, the more creative you become, and the more you work knowingly with God, which is, you know, the center of your own soul. As a drop in the ocean is part of the ocean, so is our soul part of the greater soul. And I think that's, you know, a great path for all people who want to uh, unfold that potential. Well, what you're describing is the true mysticism, the true mystical path. The self-knowing is the unifying with the creator within yourself. I mean, it's even said in like Christianity that the kingdom of heaven is within, but a lot of times this is misunderstood, externalized towards following the story of a, of a, a legend or a mythos that somehow believing in that hard enough is what will bring you to a state of completion or holiness or wholeness. And yeah, the, it's interesting. I didn't know that Walter said that corporations could be repurposed as a vehicle for unity and a better world. But in a sense, I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't. The idea of a bunch of people working together, even hierarchies can exist in a way that are not necessarily evil or compartmentalized in a negative and detrimental way. But I think it would be useful if there were if corporations were going to exist in a, a future world, we should consider the language that we're using. Corporation begins with corpse, which is a dead body, and then a ration or ration, which is uh, segmenting into parts or compartmentalizing, <laughs> which is exactly how corporations work. That people in one area know some things and other people have a different job in the corporation and they only it's a need to know basis. It works that way in, in militaries and even in cults. So maybe more transparency and more <laughs> fluidity between parts of the body of the corporation would allow for a more holistically healthy expression of that corporation. Uh, I, you know, hierarchies exist in nature. You have your mother and your father who have a natural form of authority over you. But then we have the types of authority that are invested in people that they do not have the right to have, which is a. Uh, a common misconception, especially with people that believe in something like the Constitution, that you have the humans have the ability to grant rights to individuals or to groups that they do not have in nature. And in fact, the United States as a corporation gives out licenses to different individuals and groups, which are essentially the permission to do something that would be otherwise unlawful or illegal, like a soldier has a license to kill which you can't, that doesn't actually work. You can't actually give a person the right to kill another person, even if a bunch of people voted on it. So that's that whole conversation is really interesting. And maybe corporations could be reframed and called something like Soma rations. I don't know, Soma referring to the body, a living body as opposed to a corpse. But there is something to the re, rethinking of language, recreating language. You can't just make up a word and fix the world, but you could... If enough people are using a word and give it that spiritual egregore, that power behind it that has an invested with innate meaning spiritually, then we could actually see some changes occur. The language is a big part of the division that we experience right now, though, for sure. And I back to what you started speaking on. 
the greatest quote <laughs> to uh, ta- to describe what's going on with scientific materialism, as William Wordsworth puts it, we murder to dissect. And I think that's a big part of that corporation thing because it's a dead body that's divided up into ratios, rations, <laughs> corporation. So a lot of interesting things to think about there. And when we talk about wholeness, I think one of the oldest occult mystery school traditions that's ever been is the symbol of the I single, which is misused as a, a negative symbol to refer to a sort of total surveillance, big brother idea, all seeing eye. But in truth, it's referring to the balancing of the left and the right sides and the unifying of both eyes into one or your third eye, if you will. The eye single is what is able to see both within and without and and 360 degrees, the entire circle. And I'm sure that uh, both yourself and Walter have thoughts about this notion of of balance being the key towards the the ultimate expression of imagination and and uh, access of creativity. Yeah, it brings to mind a quote by the master alchemist Falconelli. He said, "The vital thing is not the transmutation of metals, but that of the experimenter himself. It is an ancient secret that a few people rediscover each century. Unfortunately." only a handful are successful. And that that just really speaks to the whole of it. Um, To touch back to the corporations again, in the time of the Russells uh, back, you know, he was friends at one point with Thomas Watson of IBM and IBM had offices in 78 countries around the world. So he saw firsthand and he would give lectures on, on business ethics. And he would basically say that, my lectures were basically the Sermon on the Mount in disguise under using the word ethics. So he, he basically taught balance, the law of balance, which was his given uh, wording that he used from his divine illumination, uh, which created the, the work called the Divine Iliad, which basically means the divine story of creation. Um, and his, his understanding of balance You know, what you do to another, ultimately you do to yourself, you know, that which, uh, you know, to the degree you violate the law of balance is to the degree you're broken by it. So, unfortunately, we're we're not seeing the kind of world that they had envisioned, you know, the Russells seeing that the scope of corporations being international and having such far reach could be that vehicle that were able to unify people because it was the one thing that was reaching internationally. You know, you still had wars and divisions of people. And but one thing that was able to reach through the the borders of other nations was the corporate world. And I think it's just a squandered chance to to bring, you know, the possibility of more unification. And the reason is because, you know, these boards of directors that run these corporations are, again, the very people that are also teaching you know, the models of hate in the world. And they're seeking, of course, all of us know in in this movement uh, who understand and put in the time that there's groups of people that would like to see the human race enslaved and they've worked for it for thousands of years and they attempt to do it and they collapse civilization one after the other with, you know, the the kind of behaviors and, and, you know, I would, I would call it, to use the term the Russells even use mismatings, you know, when, when you basically have a licentious character, your, your mismatings and, and the things you're doing in a physical nature can actually result in, in a blown up character. I've seen too many people do it. I did it myself when I was in my late twenties and early thirties, you know, drug my character down into the ground through, through different, you know, physical, uh, mismatings, if you will. And it's easy to do because, you know, the, the, the basic human desire is to please the body from from that level. You know, that's what we try to do. A lot of us in our 20s and when you get to your 30s, if you're fortunate, you start working toward vocation, you know, the study of something you love as opposed to just pleasing yourself, which can be done in, in myriads of ways through through, you know, partying or, you know, a lot of uh, exploration of the world itself in the twenties and 
So the 30s, I, I look at as a time for people to start moving into more of a vocational, you know, desire to unfold things they love, skills, talents. In the 40s, you start to hone on those skills and sharpen them up. In the 50s, you, you kind of move in, which I'm moving into myself right now, more of the wisdom area. You know, you're, you're able to share and really develop, you know, the artistic qualities in life and I love the saying by Dr. Russell. He says, great men and women come alive at 40, where mediocre men and women begin to die at 40. So 40 is really your, your halfway point, like the carbon molecule, which is the God particle. Uh, the halfway maturity rate of the universe is the perfect sphere of carbon. And beyond carbon, you move into the transuranium elements and things that have more rings and more emission. So Toward your 70s and 80s, you get the rings around the eyes and the baggy skin. And, you know, that's just the nature of nature. It's how it works. And that's what I love about their work so much is it's based on nature's ways and processes. Even to, uh, you know, seeing how corporations could, you know, root a sort of a, you know, possible uh, progression for humanity, which, again, it's, you know, people who run them aren't interested in that. And that's part of the psychological work you have to do as well is knowing your enemy is huge because the enemy is, is concerned with one thing, dominating your senses. As long as they can dominate your senses, whatever it is with news, with cycles, with uh, events, with COVID, your senses and your fear is all projected externally, externally generated outlook. It takes the frame and turns it outward as opposed to, you know, developing a healthy inward. When's the last time you ever heard a corporation or a politician say anything about the imagination or anything about the you in you, the self? Has anybody in the universities talked about developing the self and the imagination, the healthy side of, you know, a psychological makeup? You don't hear that and you don't hear it for a reason, because as long as you're dominated to only view the world from an external, fearful, fear-based position, then everything is about survival. It's always constantly the survival mode. And as long as you're in a survival mode, you can't possibly listen to the still small voice. Um, now, there are things you can do, again, to, to develop the creative potential inside. Learning to listen to that still small voice is so, so important. And um, Russell was asked, once by a doctor who had a double PhD and was worth millions. He said, Dr. Russell, I, I don't understand how, how is it you're able to do all this stuff, all this kind of painting. You've taught yourself painting and, and, and produced all this magnificent artwork. He goes, but you don't have a lot of money. I've got millions of dollars and two PhDs and I'm a successful doctor. How is it that you were able to do it, but I can't? He's, and Russell answered him. He said, because I listen to my still small voice and you don't. So that was really cool. But uh, that's really what it takes. I think um, we can navigate this world for all the external fears that we all have to live with, the external you know, threats, the external uh, viruses. <laughs> that are all out in the air trying to come get us. You know, there, there's one thing that none of this stuff can touch, and that's the imagination. That's the inside of you, which is yourself. That's what you're looking for. And I think that's what breeds the major discontent in a lot of these groups that are out there burning the world down. They, they have contempt for their own self. They don't know it. They don't think it even exists. And they're probably taught that the world and everything that's wrong is because of the external. And so that's why they go about burning it down, thinking that's going to create the change that's going to you know, help them discover what they're missing. But that's the greatest fallacy in the world. And again, it's filled with the ranks of discontented people who, who buy onto that kind of a platform that burning down the external world is somehow going to reshape the inner world that's in turmoil in you. And nothing could be greater from, you know, a greater farce from the truth than that. That's why this kind of work, as Falconelli said, there's those who maybe just a few in a century realize that, you know, it's not about alchemy is not about transmuting metals. It's about transmuting the self, you know, and unifying those hemispheres of, of dualism that exist uh, to become whole and to see the world in a holistic way. And from that point, that standpoint, you become the master of life and death. 
you know, there is a time to use death. The death half of the wave is very useful. Um, but also knowing when to use the life half is just as important. I think that's what the unification of the hemispheres and the sun and the moon and alchemy to produce that uh, prodigal son, the, to, to produce the, the savior child in the Vesica Pisces, that unification of those hemispheres and, and becoming whole. And it's all, all too possible. I mean, anybody that desires to, you know, unify their, their uh, shadow and integrate the light together as, as one being of immense power, it's, it's right in the palm of our hands. It's there. It's ours for the asking. Problem is, too few ask. Hear, hear, my friend, hear, hear. <laughs> so much to address in the things that you just covered. I mean, so I'm going to take a stab at touching on a lot of the stuff that just came up and we'll see where that flows to. But the, maybe the first thing that's really worth talking about is back to imagination. The, I say this all the time. I really got this idea ingrained and learned it deeply from studying the work that Michael Tessarion puts out. And of course, his work is just composed of many other people's work synthesized into something, which is kind of like what, what any real philosopher is about <laughs> is taking the, the good ideas from those voices of the creator that came through humanity in the past, those few in a, in a century and making sure that they live on and move forward and are represented in an accurate and positive way. So, I think William Blake, the poet and philosopher, has a, a lot of good material that explains this idea, but that imagination, and he's not the only one, but imagination is not a mode of thinking. All thinking is an outgrowth of imagination. Imagination is the foundational thing. And when you're talking about the fact that in universities, they, they don't teach you about the self or about imagination, what they do talk about in terms of imagination usually frames it as some sort of a fantasy as something that is other from reality. But in truth, all reality is a expression of the mind of God, of the imagination of the creator. And in that sense, the inward looking that we can do and achieve that is so beneficial and so edifying to our wholeness is actually an imagination. And imagination in this sense is literally a sense. It is, it is not something abstract or inconsequential it is like another modality of perception a spiritual mode of perception walter russell talked about this how you have an idea in your head and then you build a body for it well that thing that you have in your head that idea that imagination if it can be put into a body and made to exist then it was real before you did that it had reality if it could be perceived that way it has reality hope that makes sense to everybody i think it does and then you're talking about this uh you were talking about the different stages of life. And by the way, you definitely look more 40 than 50. So you're definitely a healthy looking guy, <laughs> which is cool. But uh, Saturn, I think, is a good way of understanding what you're talking about. The Saturn return that occurs between 28 and 30. Saturn is the disciplinarian. It's father time. It's the one that brings order and structure, but also it's the death half of the wave, the angel of death, that which decays. And Whenever we've reached the age of 28 or 30, when Saturn has returned to where it was in our natal position at our birth, that means that it has traveled through every domicile of the sun or every house of the zodiac and attempted to teach discipline and teach order and balance in each of those 12 areas. So after the in those first 30 years, Saturn's pretty easy on you. He's probably not. It's probably not going to kill you to lack discipline in any of those areas it might cause you problems and it's trying to teach you. But in the next 28 or 30 year cycle, all of a sudden, the lack of discipline, the lack of learning in each of those parts of your life, in all aspects of life, as Saturn returns to each of those areas, will then begin to manifest as disease and illness. And by the time you reach your second Saturn return at 60, if you still haven't got the message about balance and taking care of yourself and dealing with your health in a proper and, and, uh, good way, then it's going to kill you, man. <laughs> the next move is it's like, all right, you've had two rounds of the circle and you're still not getting it. So clearly you need to just be dissolved back into the ether and uh, reconstituted at, at the beginning. You need to start, 
you need to be sent back a grade, <laughs> if you will. So that's one way of looking at it. But if you do have that order, that personal responsibility built from the disciplinarian side of yourself and accepting those lessons and integrating them, then you become very powerful. And in the age of 60, is probably like the greatest time of your entire life. And you've never felt more alive and more inspired and had a better connection to imagination, to the creator. It's wonderful. It's and there's always there's also that idea that as you get older, you get less active and more inward focused in the first place. Like that's a natural part of the life cycle, which is cool, too. But I'll bring this all back around to talking about the shadow because you brought that up earlier. The, there is a psychological element of the shadow, but it's very rooted in the body as well. And uh, I think that the shadow work does require that we are paying attention to the health of our body, that entire triangle that you brought up the mind body spirit or or however you want to phrase the divine trinity if you will and so shadow work is is pretty important and also something you can learn a lot about from michael tesserian's work really useful teacher in in many areas i respect that guy and i think it's cool that just through his work you and i are brought together uh, despite the fact we live not that far away from each other in the same state we might not have even necessarily easily encountered one another or got linked up so doing this type of work like you and i and and michael does and and other people like like that it really is unifying it is creating the positive type of corporation or a, a living body of humanity across a large distance if you will Absolutely. Um, gives me a, a idea to look up imagination in the home study course by the Russells. And uh, just to cover real quick, I'll, I'll throw a quote out at you. Just as man himself has come up from the primeval, from the primordial, so have his God conceptions been equally primitive. They have grown and expanded with his own mentality. The search for God has covered the range of all human instincts, intuition, emotion, superstition, imagination, creative genius, every form and substance, real and unreal, that the mind of man has been able to conceive. His imagination has not yet awakened, and which means that his creative powers have not yet awakened. And basically, the, the more we look at the world and we can line up um, an understanding of the creator and bring it up to speed, if you will, the more we're going to be able to imagine something different in terms of a structure, you know, and I'm all for society and the world upgrading. Upgrades are good, right? I mean, we got to upgrade our definition of the creator, uh, upgrade our use of imagination. You know, it is too unfortunate that the imagination has imagined de devils, demons. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the last time we got together about um, psychedelics, the misuse of psychedelics and how um, through my research, I actually uncovered that the majority of demonic experiences comes from the use of psychedelics, which opens the mind uh, to all kinds of phantasms. It doesn't necessarily make it real, though, and that's the pro the power of the human imagination is that it can imagine anything. And for myself, I used to imagine that the devil lived under my stairs when I was a child, and he was real. He was there. Every damn bit of it was there. I was so terrified of what was under the basement stairs in the dark of the basement, number one. So, you know, being afraid of the dark as a child, the imagination runs wild. The proper use of imagination, however, uh, my dad bought me a BB gun, and so I became the hunter, and I went to kill the devil. And guess what? He wasn't there. It was all in my mind, you know, but I was brave. Once I got that gun, you know, I was brave, and I went down, went under the stairs with the flashlight, and I was going to confront Satan and cast him out of my house by force. <laughs> and lo and behold, that was my first lesson in my own imagination running away with itself. So again, we, we have, you know, the childlike beginnings of the human race have imagined all kinds of things, including a dominant world run by a few psychopaths. That's these people's imagination and it's working very well, but we can counter their 
structures with our own structures. We can imagine our own civilization, our own kind of culture, you know, and I think it's a good chance what's happening right now with Hollywood basically sinking into the into the mud and mire and muck, you know, the, the, the degenerate uh, imaginations of people are self-destructing. You know, Hollywood's losing its grip on the human mind. I love that. And now what that does is it levels the playing field for people to reimagine a new culture, uh, their own culture, if you will. I'd like to see really a lot of, you know, which we are seeing. Look at look at the film festivals. You know, we're seeing people making films that would have we would have never imagined in a million years would be making films. You know, if you go back to the 80s, you were very fortunate to even be able to own a video camera. But now anybody can make, you know, a documentary. Anybody can make music for the most part. When I started playing music in the 80s, you know, I would have never imagined that, you know, the mixing board was $2,000 for a 16 channel mixing board. But now you can get one for about 80 bucks and do all the mixing in your house. You know, everything is there on the computer. It's, it's really, the arts have really become accessible. And so in this time, in this period, when Hollywood is, is self imploding, there's a real chance for people to use their imaginations and become creative individuals. And so despite what's happening in the world, like you said, the return of Saturn is kind of bringing about a, a decay and a, and a destruction in the falsity around us. And so we're seeing what's false in Hollywood, how it's just corrupt and, and retarded. <laughs> really, it is at this point retarded. Yeah, yeah Plut Pluto is in Pluto's in Capricorn right now. And Pluto is the like the death destroyer, if you will, the dissolver and Capricorn is Saturn's domicile. So there's like some serious revealing of the untruth and destruction of the untruth happening right now, according to the sky clock and as it should be. Right. And so it's peeling back that layer of deception, that layer of, you know, uh, we've all been in a deep slumber, I, I would say, where we've let all our culture be created without us even taking part in it. You know, that's that's really what I see a lot of people waking up to is is realizing that hey, this has all been made, everything's been made and created, but I didn't have anything to do with it other than consuming it. You know, and that's that's why I like to call myself a prosumer. You know, I'm, I'm not going to consume anything. I'm going to prosume because, you know, I'm going to make the choice whether I want to be part of this, whether I want to watch it, whether I want to, you know, it's not going to decide for me that, you know, what, what I choose to uh, take into my inner being and, and reflect in my soul. So the beauty of that, you know, I see a lot of potential, you know, where others might see negativity and, and pessimistic attitudes tend to, uh, you know, dominate in the threads on Facebook tend to dominate, you know, but what is the good thing? The good thing is that, you know, nobody knew who Bill Gates was uh, until just the last six months. And now everybody's familiar with you know, his psychopathic nature. So there, just in that, you know, you can, you can see a lot of good where the things that nobody knew are now common knowledge today. And, and one of those things is the decay of Hollywood and the chance for us to interject and recreate culture, you know, with our own uh, creative potential and creative desires. And that's all part and parcel to, you know, living a rich and fulfilled life. You know, the more creative potential you utilize within yourself, the more you can stand and look at the bodies that you have made or listen to them. In my case, I'm a musician. I've written about 250 songs and uh, only recorded 250, but I've probably written four or 500, you know, but so there's still a lot to do, a lot to go on. And, you know, I happen to, to take a break from my own creative life to help recreate the life of Walter Russell in a living museum. And, you know, that's proof to me that all I simply did was applied their philosophy to get their stuff back out to the world. You know, holding that thought of the museum was front and center for the longest time. And it took many years to do it, 11 years, actually. Um, so it was a thought that lasted 11 years until it was birthed and completed and all the finishing touches were put on it. So, you know, having a goal, having a desire, number one, is what it takes to move the will, you know, and it's, we've you know, touched on 
a lot of things here regarding creativity, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, the, the great benefit to humanity from utilizing its imagination correctly, you know, not imagining a world of chains and suffering and enslavement, but imagining a world where justice is brought to those who are attempting to overthrow the human race. So, you know, and I think we're going to win at the end of the day because we've got too many on the side of life, which is the value and, and the valuing of life itself, you know, worshiping life and reveling in life. And not, I don't just mean uh, for the sake of the body, but I mean for the sake of the, the physical, the, the mental and the spiritual. Uh, we're all born into the triangle of life. We're born in the lower left corner of the triangle, which would be physical. And from the physical, the right side of the triangle is mental. They begin to meet as you progress through your physical nature and develop your mental. They meet and that inner pillar is the peak of the triangle, which is your spirituality. And that spirituality is fused by the balance of the the physical and the mental. And so in balancing your own triangle of life, your, your spiritual is born from the balance of the physical and mental and the, you know, the unfoldment of both. And we really have that potential within each of us to affect the world. You know, the more balance you have, the more power you have. Uh, every great teacher will tell you this. Bruce Lee, uh, so many others will say, you know, balance is the ultimate power because you have the ultimate power when in balance. You can draw from that source of power. Any amount, infinitesimal amounts of it can be used to create, to, you know, pursue your goals and dreams and visions. And it's all there at our fingertips. I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of good places to go from here. Um, we are getting close to the end. So we're going to give you the last couple of minutes to give people some ideas on how they can get involved with the philosophy.org family, get what you might want to point them towards, maybe the future of your own personal art and your own personal work with the Walter Russell group. But uh, <laughs> gosh, there's so much. Uh, I, I do have, and I return to a lot of the topics that we were, we glazed over in the first hour. And so before we wrap up the first hour, I'll give a summary of some of the things that I'm going to plan to get us into in the second hour. But I just got to say um, that this is what the world needs to be focusing on right now. This is, I mean, it's always been about balance and it's always going to be about balance. And that is where our infinite potential is uh, generated from. So yeah, let's go ahead and move towards the end of this first hour. And thanks for being here. This is, this is awesome. I, I knew that we could just get on here without much of a, a solid plan and deliver the gold because that's how it works. It's a flow state. Whenever you have this mindset, whenever you have this intention, whenever you align your thoughts, your emotions and your actions into a unison, the universe will, you know, reward that. So th thanks, man. This is great. It's great to join you, Chance. And just real quick uh, recap to give people um, how to contact me. You can either go to mattpresti.com or uh, facebook.com forward slash mattprestiofficial. Um, I don't know how long I'll be on there. And, and that goes for all of us. <laughs> you know, I don't, again, you know, it's going to become illegal at some point more than likely to, to be even referring to imagination or, you know, creative potential or looking within it's, it's really, you know, the black boot stomping on the side of humanity. And it's just a phase we all have to go through, but I would fully recommend for anybody that, that wants a shot of adrenaline in the arm, in the heart, you know, you really want to get on the creative bandwagon and move yourself into a creative lifestyle. Definitely check out the home study course by Walter and Leo Russell. Um, you can find that at philosophy.org and just type in the search or go to the store, philosophy.org forward slash store. Uh, we are carrying the third edition again, uh, as the Russells had intended. Uh, the fourth edition is discontinued. That was amended by a previous administration. Uh, so we, we honored the wishes of the founders, Walter and Leo Russell, and returned to the third edition. The third edition is absolutely incredible. 
I can't push it enough, but it's a $200 investment and you're going to get more than you would putting $250,000 into a college double PhD by going this route than you would going to college because it's going to give you the ultimate power. And for, for 1200 bucks, you can buy everything the Russell's ever wrote, you know, and that's a lot of people complain about the price, but it's like, you know, get a cosmic education for a thousand dollars or spend $80,000 on a indoctrination uh, uh, at, at the so-called puny university, right? Uh, they, they become worldly and teach more or less uncritical thinking at this point. So I'm fortunate to be involved with the university that, that gives man a cosmic education. And if you go to philosophy.org forward slash store and enter the code SUMMER20, S-U-M-M-E-R-2-0, you will get 20% off. So that's even better. You can get a cosmic education for 20% off now through the 24th of July. But yeah, philosophy.org, mattpresti.com. I look forward to chatting on the other side, Chance. Very cool. And I'll just throw in there about the, you know, the price that you just mentioned. I can see both sides why copyright and uh, holding information for a cost is not desirable in the overall scheme of humanity. But then I could see the side of needing that type of support and funding to just keep the upkeep of the museum to keep the uh, the cost of running the the University of Science and Philosophy. There's there's two sides here. So try not to be too one sided about how you look at that and just realize that the even the fact that you're investing, say, the 20 percent off getting a book for 180 instead of 200 bucks, if you're putting that much of your own energy into it in the form of your currency, I think that you'll be that much more invested literally in making sure that you uh, learn, integrate and apply that knowledge as opposed to just something that you did pick up for free and maybe also cast aside just as carelessly. So I see both sides of the argument and I definitely support you guys with what you're doing. And I hope more people find a way to support you guys as well. And it's been awesome talking with you, Matt. In the second hour, I want to get into maybe what you and also Walter Russell might think about disease and the current COVID thing. I'd like to talk about biofield tuning a little bit. That's something I'm really interested in lately. Also the idea return to the idea of demons, which I see as meaning divided ones, which perfectly fits with the architecture of thought that we've been expressing up to this point. And also look at BLM a little bit more and the, the roots and the intentions behind the organization of that movement, not, as in a judgmental light to look at individual people who have supported the movement and have good intentions of wanting equality, but to look at what the outcome of crowd psychology leads to in the first place and where this type of stuff is actually originating from and why we should be skeptical of any mass movement that goes viral to return to the idea of the virus, but in a different sense. And uh, uh, there's probably more. I'd like to get into some of the fake counterculture that we see expressed as being somehow an authentic and original uh, going against the grain of mainstream corporate culture, when in fact, it's very much just a, a hidden version of the same thing. And so that's a lot of stuff, guys, that's going to be in the second hour if we can fit it all in. And I hope that you guys see come and join us on the other side of the break. You can sign up at patreon.com slash interverse. And yeah, once again, Matt, thanks for being here. And I'm looking forward to the other side. Yeah, you got it. And I'll just quickly add that you can find the home study course for free online. And I encourage if you don't have the money, go read it and then donate to the university later down the road. If you can, all the proceeds from the sales of books and donations go to preserve the Russell legacy for posterity. So we appreciate you. Awesome. All right, guys. See you on the other side. All right. Here we are at the end of another episode. <laughs> Feeling pretty chill. How about you guys? I'm really happy about the conversation we just had with Matt. He is a cool person, and it's nice to be friends with him. He's got a rational, <laughs> calm, but st strong and uh, stern <laughs> type of view towards uh, the reality. Very inward-directed thinker and expresses himself really well. I like how this conversation went. We definitely just took it as it came with a, a nice flow and not really much planning ahead of time. 
The only thing I wanted to talk about specifically was the Walter Russell Museum that he has going. And I hope I can go visit that someday. It's really not close to where I live, but it would be super sweet to see even just that one small percent of Walter Russell's work. Don't forget, if you want to find out more about Walter Russell, his philosophy, his writings, see more of his art, you can go to philosophy.org, which is their website for the University of Science and Philosophy. It's pretty sweet. I think that Matt's been doing a great job since he took over as president over there. I say took over, but I know that he's not doing all the work. There's other people that work with him, and it's just an important thing to keep alive uh really cool art and be inspired by it not to make it like a religion of course and it's not that way with walter russell but to let it continue to inspire others instead of uh allowing history to cover it up with the dirt of forgetting (laughs) because yeah this stuff is worth remembering i mean the museum is just amazing to know that one person can do all of these things and like learn all these different skills themselves it's quite remarkable um, what what you're really looking at with somebody that is expressing the universal imagination so freely and able to build amazing bodies for his living thoughts and to do that all with the type of healthy philosophy, love of wisdom. That's what philosophy means that he, that Walter Russell had and that Matt Presty keeps alive with his uh, with his personal l- way he lives and the way that he shares the Walter Russell work and adds his own thoughts to it and updates things, if you will. Th- this is what it means to be biophilic. Biophilic. <laughs> Biophilia, the love of life. And what we're like, the love of feeling good that life feels good to be in. It's a really important word to. A, attribute to ourselves, I think, because what we have in culture right now is a necrophilus type of expression, which is obsessed with death, obsessed, with, not just obsessed with death, though, but like things that you consider dead are what the culture loves most. And what that would be a artificial, artificial stuff. If something's not alive, then therefore, by default, it's dead. And if it's not uh, the expression of a, of nature, or the expression of a living man or woman that is aligned with nature and nature's laws, natural law, then it's some kind of artificiality that is, in a way, uh, what you would consider dead. So just think about how people in the world today are probably feeling in their own bodies or rejecting the feeling of being in their own bodies because it doesn't feel good. This is sort of why... People are living so much through screens and through media more than ever before because they have to find more and more ways to self-hypnotize and keep themselves from thinking about how it doesn't feel very good to be in their body. And that's too bad because a healthy and balanced body feels really amazing to be in. And it creates the biophilia automatically whenever you're aligned and whenever you have all you're firing on all cylinders, all of your Every part of your different core systems are operational. But when we do have this like hate, hatred of our own life because it feels so crappy just to physically be in our body, in our, in our life, I think that's where we start getting all this really backwards, anti-life type of expressions. And so <laughs> here we go. I'm going <laughs> to hopefully not make anyone too mad here. But just hear me out. Don't just tune this out or reject this out of hand. In the plus extension, one of the things we talked about was Black Lives Matter. And in no means were we trying to say that black lives do not matter. But, you know, not even trying to say there's no systemic racism. Hopefully we express that that exists. Or at least in other conversations, I've expressed that like, yeah, I recognize systemic racism. No doubt. But... What I see online a lot is that when another person comes back talking to a Black Lives Matter person and says, all lives matter, they get called racist. So just please, just please think about this, like through your heart center for a moment. Is it racist to say all lives matter? 
Or is it biophilic to say all lives matter? <laughs> to say just one type of life matters and the others don't matter is really weird. Or to say that it's somehow wrong to think that they all matter. Just realize that these type of divisions of cultural identities are what keep the our entire human species conquered, essentially. Divide and conquer. That's what the game has always been. So um, hopefully that didn't make too many people annoyed that I said that because it seems to be a super huge trigger to say all lives matter. But that is what I know in my heart to be true. And I think that systemic racism should be addressed, but really it's not going to unless we figure out this whole class classism thing that's going on. I think that's a, a bigger deal than racism overall, because I just don't know a lot of examples of racism in my daily life. Not saying it's not out there, but I am saying pretty confidently that most people aren't racist and most people just want to be cool and don't really care about what race other people are. And we're all humans, right? So just keep that in mind before you get all jumping, jump into a bandwagon, get yourself involved in a big collective group think mass hysteria thing because those just don't go well. I'm sorry to say it. You got to, we got to retain our individuality and not <laughs> join a herd of some kind and uh, not attack other people just because they are thinking um, differently than us and not wanting to use the same slogan as us and maybe want one that's more inclusive like all lives. But anyway, that's more of a digression I meant to get into there. But let's talk about the other parts in the plus extension real quick. We talked about what we thought Walter Russell might think about disease. We're trying to look at the current pandemic thing from the lens of Walter Russell philosophy and science and that kind of the kind of thought, which is cool. Talked about biofield tuning a little bit. Talked about the concept of what demons are, divided ones. <laughs> Fits into what we're just discussing. We discussed the fake counterculture and music industry, which is cool. I've been trying to bring that up with certain guests lately. And I want to make that an entire episode topic just so people can really understand how how contrived and controlled even what seems like counterculture has really been throughout the decades and how that's just replayed the same strategy generationally. We did take, we talked a lot about music actually. So that's cool. If you like music, the plus extension was rad. If you like the first hour, you'll like the second hour. What can I say? And all you got to do is donate five bucks through Patreon, patreon.com slash interverse. And not only do you get this episode for a meager $5 tip, the same thing you tip a waiter or somebody that served you food. You also get all the other episodes for the month and all the episodes from previous months. If you can listen to them all in one month, all that for $5. Uh, so if you stay on month to month, you have a better shot of actually getting through all the archives. But Hey, my point is all I'm asking for is the same thing. You tip a waiter and it's like the cost of a Starbucks or something. But instead of getting just the one meal, like you did at the restaurant, you're getting all of these episodes that we've done or at least access to them. So think about that. And we, <laughs> we talked about biophilia. We talked about Walter Russell. Let's see what else what did I want to bring up in this outro? Um, I really, what I like most about Walter Russell, he's a polymath. Polymath is somebody that poly, which is many and math. It's like different forms of, I guess like, um, <laughs> application of number analysis or scientific looking at reality. I'm, I'm not exactly sure the best way to define polymath without looking it up in a dictionary other than it's colloquially, colloquial, colloquial, <laughs> that way, uh, uh, the common usage of the word it relates to someone that is um, educated on a lot of subjects at once. So that's an interesting thing to be or to seek to be. Walter Russell was probably that for sure although not educated formally, he, he's also a philomath. This is something that I consider myself to be similar to a polymath, but instead of being a holder of many types of knowledge or a lover of many types of knowledge and wisdom. And then there's the autodidact. I love this word too. Definitely something Walter Russell was. I consider myself this. An autodidact is somebody that teaches themselves things. And we live in the age where being an autodidact has never been easier. You got all the information at your fingertips thanks to this crazy internet thing. So the most inspirational thing about Walter Russell is those three words, polymath, philomath, autodidact. You can be that. 
And it has to do with the level of biophilia versus necrophilia. Like how good does it feel to live and to be in your body or how bad does it feel and how much do you need to push that um, bad feeling away and ignore it and spend a lot of your energy just holding it, it at bay. So the healthier we can get physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the more naturally we're going to express our aptitude to be a polymath and a philomath and an autodidact. And you can do it. It's not just like Walter Russell was this one super genius Leonardo da Vinci reincarnation and you'll never be able to be that. And, you know, you might be thinking, oh, it's too, I'm too old to begin the training like Luke Skywalker in Empire Strikes Back. But you're really not. You're actually infinity years old. So whatever, <laughs> whatever age you think you are in this physical body, what you actually are is limitless and beyond time and beyond space. And we're only experiencing the limitations of the construct we're in right now as a learning experience. And also for fun to some degree, believe it or not, <laughs> biophilia, life is actually supposed to feel good and be fun. I mean, I say supposed to. The universe and nature respects the dark side and the light side equally which is cool. But I mean, what do you want to be? You want to be empowered by your hate, but also destroyed by it? Or do you want to be expanding in love constantly, infinite possibilities, infinite potential? I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> I'm going for the biophilia side of the force, though. It's more, it just feels better. <laughs> Okay, so one thing I wanted to do is let you know that uh, other than supporting the show on Patreon and getting all that sweet content, you can, wow, there's cool stuff. I got some stuff in my shop. Uh, I forgot to tell you guys about this for months, but there is an Interverse t-shirt and a poster. And I'm going to be adding more types of posters and maybe other types of shirts, maybe other types of shirts as I get around to it. Go to interversepodcast.com and hit the shop link in the main links section at the top. And if you want to get a shirt, that's a sweet way to support me. And you get to not only support me a little bit financially. I'm sorry, it's $25, but it's uh, it's worth it. You're supporting me financially with a cut of that. And you're also supporting the show by wearing it around on your body as a conversation piece. Uh, but what's cool is, A, I don't have to actually mess with shipping or getting those printed and holding inventory the way that that shop works is they just print it off for me and ship it to themselves. So that's why it's $25, that and the fact that it's uh, supposed to be ethically sourced and sustainable materials and manufacturing methods. So theoretically, I mean, if you come at me with information that shows that this company was not cool like that, please do. I would like to know. But looks like it's a pretty legit company and good way to send out these shirts. So I'd love it if you got one. That'd be something cool you can do if you don't want to sign up for Plus or you're already on Plus and you just want to support me more for some reason. <laughs> I definitely would, would not mind. Another way to support the show though is to get on the iTunes podcast app and leave a review. I haven't asked you guys to do this for a long time, although I did ask some people on social media to do it the other day. And I got a, I got three nice new reviews. I wanted to read them for you to inspire you as to what you might say <laughs> if you want to. Although when you leave a five-star review on iTunes, you actually can just drop the five stars and dip. You don't have to write anything. It's super fast. You can be done in like a few seconds. And the more of you that do that, the more new people will find the show just kind of having it served to them on iTunes. And that could be nice. You never know who might wander into our tribe because of that. So would love it if you did. Here's what some of the people recently said about Interverse on the iTunes reviews. Steve in PDX wrote, high quality podcast. This podcast is perfect for the creatively conscious and intellectually omnivorous. Chance has the chops to get into the flow state with his guests, ask great questions, and give them the space to present their information. It's entertaining, informative, and has led to quite a few epiphanies in the time I've been tuning in to the full paid version. Can't recommend highly enough. Steve, you're a real wordsmith and a wonderful person, and it's cool to know you actually were talking to each other all the time on Discord. Forgot to mention that. You guys can join the Discord, also linked on my website, and if I remember in the show notes for this episode and future ones, uh, great way to connect with the tribe. I hop in there when I can and also <laughs> leave my thoughts on whatever's being talked about and shared there. It's super cool. I love Discord. It doesn't just mean lack of accord or lack of harmony. Discord could also mean the cutting of cords and the removing of bonds and bondage. So it's a powerful tool to 
rid ourselves of attachment to beliefs that are incorrect because we can ask each other questions and share knowledge and help each other on the path. And maybe we all move a little faster that way. I like the community thing. It's beautiful. Okay. So a couple other reviews. Jaden Free wrote the best of the best. Love this podcast. Definitely give it a listen. Chance will get you thinking prayer hands emoji or thank you hands. I don't know. I guess like the prayer hands is now thank you hands too. I do it, so <laughs> I guess that's what it means. Another review. Oh, thanks, Jaden, also. But another review is uh, Buff Islands wrote, Deep podcast with incredible guests. Innerverse is a podcast featuring profound discussions with some amazing minds that is always mentally stimulating to listen to. It can expand your consciousness to see a wider band of reality. Heck yeah, man. That's kind of what I'm going for. Uh, man or woman. Actually, I don't know who wrote that, but... Thanks for the reviews. It's super sweet of you guys to get on and do that. And if anyone else wants to do that, it's going to be majorly appreciated. But now, time to get out of here, wrap up this episode. Thanks again, Matt Presti, for joining me. <laughs> uh, I love you guys for tuning in. I'm going to play us out with a song by Wisdom Traders. Wisdom Traders made the intro music to this show that I've been using for a long time. He's a real life, real life friend of mine quote unquote and uh he's an awesome person and i love sharing his music this one's called thick so you can find that linked in the show notes as well if you want to go follow wisdom traders on soundcloud you won't regret it and with that i'm done i'll talk to you guys soon really good content coming out in just a week or so super stoked on it much love talk to you guys later bye bye <laughs>